Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Alrighty. Let's get right into it, guys. Uh, I finished the uh, part one about 30 minutes ago. Just finished uploading that. So let's get right into this. I saw a full um, version of this, both parts. But I, I'd prefer to do it in parts in parts one and two because I'm not the greatest learner. Let's 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 just accept that. Um, and uh, it makes it easier to divide into two so that my questions in the first part can be more focused on, and then my questions in the second part can be answered. And uh, that can help me learn. So let's do it. Let's hop right into it. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the armchair historian. This is part two of our updated video on the Crimean War. In the part one, we watched how an argument over some churches in Palestine led to three empires invading Russia. Following this perfectly natural escalation came a year and a half of bloody, brutal fighting, with neither side gaining the upper hand. And when the dust settled at the end, although no land had been gained or lost by anyone, events were set in motion that would one day change- I, By the way, I'd recommend watching the first part, either my reaction to it or right from the channel, but that's up to you. I just want to make sure everything is going right. Okay. Europe gaining the upper hand. And when the dust settled at the end, although no land had been gained or lost by anyone, events were set in motion that would one day change Europe forever. The Armchair Historian channel is made possible by our sponsors. Supporting them is the best way to cite athletics. Have a base with supervision and on the space dot inclusive battle of ballot. I love that I found another channel with like cool maps that I like to. I don't know why, like when there's just a really pleasing map to look at in these history videos, I just enjoy it more. TV. So I'm glad I found this. After the inconclusive battle of Balaclava, Russian strategists believed that their enemy's supply lines were overextended and vulnerable to attack. On November 5th, the Russians gathered a force of 42,000 men to assault the British near the village of Inkerman with the goal of breaking through their defenses. I just want to say, so there's a common theme no matter what the channel or what the, uh, the war is or what time, there's always the encirclement tactics. And I never see when someone is encircled the other them really be able to push back and so this is pretty rare that seems like the russians are putting up a a fight still before reinforcements could arrive of 42,000 men to assault the British near the village of Inkerman with the goal of breaking through their defenses before reinforcements could arrive Advancing in the early hours of the morning, the attackers were hidden by a thick fog as they approached the British defenses at a hill called Home Ridge. The French and British defenders on and around Home Ridge numbered only around 13,000, less than a third of the size of the Russian army bearing down on them. Fighting began at dawn when the Russian general Fedor Soymanov sent around 15,000 men to assault the ridge, which in the early stages of battle was defended by just 2,700 men. I just, I have a thought kind of unrelated that I get sometimes that I got to ask or I'm not going to be able to listen. Just uh, any Russians, there are, a lot of, there are some Russian viewers. Why is there, why is the of so popular in last names, the OV? I know it's not really relevant. I just... I had to ask it or else it would have just stuck in my mind. So if there's a reason for that. A lot of last names like Kutusov or Av. I'm just curious the about ridge, that. Sorry. Which General Unrelated. Fedor Soymanov sent around 15,000 men to assault the ridge, which in the early stages of battle was defended by just 2,700 men of the British 2nd Division. However, British forward defenses in the valley did catch sight of the Russians advancing through the fog and opened fire, alerting the men of the 2nd Division to attack. But due to this fog, the defenders on Home Ridge had no idea how outnumbered they truly were. Emboldened by their ignorance, the acting commander of the 2nd Division, Major General John Pennyfeather, ordered the entire force to advance down the hill and meet the Russians head on. The Russians attempted to soften up the defenders by bombarding Home Ridge with artillery. However, they didn't realize that the second division was no longer on the hill. They didn't become aware of the impending counterattack until the British soldiers emerged from the fog right in front of them, and fighting began almost immediately. 
The Russians attempted to break through on the second division's left flank, but were pushed back. Their outdated flintlock muskets completely outmatched by the British Enfield percussion lock rifles. In the fighting that followed, Soymanov, the Russian shield their outdated flintlock muskets completely outmatched by the British Enfield percussion lock rifles. In the fighting that followed, Soymanov, the Russian general, was killed. And so just sorry, um, so the flintlock is more of like it, it it's more susceptible to, to dampness and not working, whereas the percussion is just some more modern like the you know, you pull the trigger and then the thing uh, slams against the back of the bullet and and uh, ignites it and it fires and so I guess that's a new invention now. In the Let fighting me know if I'm that wrong. followed, Soymanov, the Russian general, was killed and swiftly replaced by another officer who was then promptly shot and killed too. Followed by a third commander who survived for a few minutes and then was killed too. At this point, the remaining Russian officers were understandably reluctant to take charge, and so promptly withdrew to regroup as British reinforcements poured in. Once a second- Wait, who's in charge now? Well, the last three people to say that just died. Uh, so Column of withdrew to regroup as were understandably reluctant to take charge, and so promptly withdrew to regroup as British reinforcements poured in. Once a second column of Russian troops arrived in assistance, the Tsar's men shifted their focus to the northeast, where the British had set up a defensive wall called the Barrier. 15,000 men advanced on the Barrier, which was being held by only 300 troops. Channeling their inner Spartans, these 300 men... I was men just about to say that. ...only 300 troops. Channeling their inner Spartans, these 300 men fixed bayonets and vaulted over the wall to charge at the Russian army. With the fog still hampering visibility on both sides, the bayonet charge caused enough. I like that. I think that's so cool. With the, I, the I fog just... still hampering visibility on both sides, the bayonet charge caused enough confusion among the Russians to halt their advance, giving enough time for reinforcements to arrive and attack the Russians' flank, forcing them to withdraw. Still not knowing exactly what was going on, the Imperial Russian army gathered up for one final push on Home Ridge. The fighting was fierce and hectic, with the dense haze forcing many units on both sides to act completely on their own initiative, cut off from their allies, which would eventually earn the Battle of Anchorman the nickname the Soldier's Battle. Just as the British defenders began to falter, the timely arrival of French reinforcements allowed them to hold back the Russians and ultimately drive them away from Home Ridge, bringing the battle to an end. At the end of the day, approximately one third of the Allied and Russian soldiers fighting in the battle had been killed, wounded, or captured. The demoralized survivors retreated back behind the walls of Sevastopol, and the Allied forces dug in for a long siege. Do you know what I really like so far? Like I learned in the last video that the first naval battle that used explosive shells with cannons happened, and this one with kind of flintlock rifles being outdated. It's kind of showing the evolution of weaponry, which I think is cool because it kind of separate just World War One and since to pre World War One weapons, maybe pre World War Two and post World War Two weapons, but. Uh, it's cool to see the sort of evolution of them in, in the 19th century. The bitter cold of the ensuing winter, coupled with severe supply shortages among the besiegers, soon led to a halt in ground operations. A massive storm in late November destroyed 30 Allied transport ships, many carrying crucial winter clothing and other supplies, which led to thousands of deaths of hypothermia and disease. The Russians made one more attempt to break out of the siege in February of 1855, attacking an Ottoman base at the town of Eupatoria, north of Sevastopol. Heavy artillery from the Ottomans' well-fortified positions forced the Russians back, and the attack was called off after just three hours of fighting. The assault on Eupatoria was the last major Russian effort to break the siege, but the miserable struggle for Sevastopol was far from over. In March, British contractors completed the construction of the Grand Crimean Central Railway, a rail line built to quickly bring the struggle for Sevastopol was far from over. 
In March, British contractors completed the construction of the Grand Crimean Central Railway, a rail line built to quickly bring ammunition and supplies from the ships to the siege lines. The railway allowed the Allies to intensify their bombardments of the city, but it did little to stave off the waves of disease running rampant through their camps, killing tens of thousands. The flagging morale of the Allied forces was bolstered somewhat by the arrival of 18,000 fresh troops from the Kingdom of Sardinia, whose king hoped to strengthen his alliance with France. What was their knowledge of disease at this point? Um... Somewhat by the about that. arrival of 18,000 fresh troops from the Kingdom of Sardinia, whose king hoped to strengthen his alliance with France. Wait, what? Sorry. The, the flagging morale of the Allied forces was bolstered somewhat by the arrival of 18,000 fresh troops from the Kingdom of Sardinia, whose king hoped to strengthen his alliance with France. The Sardinian troops provided welcome support, but even so, when Sevastopol finally fell on September 9th, both sides were utterly exhausted, and no further operations were conducted in Crimea before the next winter arrived. Further east, the Russians and Ottomans continued battering against each other in the Caucasus. Where this guy's got a great setup. Uh, I, it seems it's... Green screen, it seems, but very good. That it's the real desk mug. Nice pipe there. Their small and inconclusive engagements had been fought throughout the war. While a hand the Russians and Ottomans continued battering against each other in the Caucasus, where small and inconclusive engagements had been fought throughout the war. While a handful of towns and forts in the region changed hands, neither side was able to make any decisive gains on that front. This trend was reflected across many other fronts, with inconclusive skirmishes taking place in the Azov Sea, the Baltic, and even Russia's Pacific coast. By late 1855, after years of bloody and pointless fighting, both sides were thoroughly sick Russian five, Pacific the coast. Baltic, and even Russia's Pacific coast. By late 1855, after years of bloody and pointless fighting, both sides were thoroughly sick of the war. The British public especially fed up with reports of fiascos like the charge of the Light Brigade and the staggering death toll from disease during the siege of Sevastopol began to demand an immediate end to the conflict. New technologies like the telegram and photography were making the truth about the horrors of war more accessible to the average citizen. I was just about to ask, that's weird, when, like, is this the start where public opinion really, really started to matter? It must have mattered forever, honestly, public opinion, but just the, the ease of information getting to your public must have made a big difference in how commanders, I guess, make decisions. ...than ever before, contributing to an unprecedented public outcry. Although the new British Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston, had great ambitions of expanding the war and permanently crippling the Russian Empire, pressure from the public and his French allies eventually forced him to agree to peace talks. Bloody hell. On the Russian side, the new Tsar Alexander II felt pressured to make peace after Austria, Prussia, and Sweden began showing signs that they might be willing to join the war on the Allies' side. Thus, on March 30th, 1856, the Treaty of Paris was signed and brought the Crimean War to an end. The treaty essentially amounted to a status quo, restoring orthodox control of the churches in Palestine, forcing Russia and the Ottomans to return to each other's captured territories, and banning any nation from maintaining warships or fortified ports in the Black Sea. This clause of the treaty was later ignored by the Russians in 1871, after the fall of Napoleon III in France caused the French to lose interest in Eastern geopolitics. Six years later, in 1877, the Russian Empire attacked the Ottomans again, this time claiming territory in the Caucasus and securing the independence of Bulgaria and other Balkan states without much outside interference. As Russia simply went back and took what it had been after in the first place, many in Europe were left wondering what the point of the Crimean War had been.
Ultimately, the only tangible outcome of the Crimean War was a tremendous loss of life on both sides. Around 165,000 of all Allied troops died, and almost 120,000 of those died of disease. The Russians lost 130,000, 89,000 of which were to disease. That's so crazy how many people died of disease. In Britain, the public was outraged by the strategic and logistical failures at all levels of command during the war, and widespread calls began for sweeping reforms of the army and greater professionalism in the medical field in particular. The demands for army reforms were ultimately blocked, but the push for medical reform, spurred on by the famous battlefield nurses Florence Nightingale and Mary C. Cole, were much more successful, leading to the development of professional nursing in Britain and improving health care for all British society. In Russia, the embarrassment of defeat prompted a major push for modernization across all sectors of society in order to catch up with the rest of Europe. The wave of reforms in the years following the Crimean War included the abolishment of serfdom, expansion of rail and telegraph networks, modernization of medicine, and the reorganization and modernization of the army. The Crimean War exposed some of the most devastating flaws of the established ways of waging war in Europe, prompting major efforts to modernize on both sides. This push towards technological dominance contributed to the rise of nationalism in Russia, an ideology which would profoundly impact the nation's foreign policy for the rest of the 19th century. Further Russian interference in the Balkans would later give rise to nationalist sentiments in that volatile region, escalating tensions that would eventually boil over into the assassination of an Austrian prince in 1914. In many ways, the Crimean War was the first small domino in the tensions that would eventually boil over into the assassination of an Austrian prince in 1914. In many ways, the Crimean War was the first small domino in the chain leading up to the world wars that's so cool I, that is my favorite part about history about learning about history is getting the little connections and learning about the next domino and the next domino and seeing how everything is connected obviously any event has a precursor no one goes to war for no reason um this seemed to be a a, a, a not silly it it just seems like it might have been a wake-up call for Europe, um, I'm not sure until how after it, it was a wake-up call, but the amount of death with the original cause of the war, it just seems disproportionate. I could be wrong. Let me know if I said stuff wrong in the comments. It's not quite over yet, but is it over? Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. First small domino in the chain leading up to the world wars. So I love learning about this stuff. All right. Awesome video. I want to learn about the Franco-Prussian War next. I think there's an armchair historian video series on that. So hope you guys are doing well. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if I did anything wrong. Join the Discord. See you guys next time.